Designed for two to five players, the game of feudum is not for the faint of heart. After all, you've just been banished, stripped of all earthly possessions, and forced into a strange land ruled by a not-so-chummy monarch. Splendid! Let's set up the game. To begin, select a colour and put the following into your personal supply. Three pawns, four player discs, or reeves, eleven action cards, seven influence markers, seven food, seven shillings, and one player pouch. Place a blank player disc on the scoring track space marked with a zero. Now, create a general supply of resources as follows. Place the vessels near the Alchemist Guild. Place the influence markers and monsters near the Knight Guild. <laughs> place the King's Seals near the Noble Guild. And place the Shillings, Archery Targets and Royal Writ Cards near the board. Next, create six stacks of Region Tiles in descending order and place them on the Region Tile spaces. Now, set aside all the double-sided location discs and randomly place the remaining teal coloured discs onto all 22 map spaces. Be sure to place the ones with circles onto the spaces also marked as circles. Finally, turn all the location discs face up. Bravo! Place goods into the Merchant Guild as shown, leaving the last space in the Saltpeter and Sulphur rows empty. Fill the Alchemist Guild as shown, leaving two spaces in the Food Cart and Sulphur Bowl empty. Also, randomly draw two vessels and place them in the space provided. Now, tidy things up a bit by placing all remaining goods into the haversack. From the general supply of resources, place two influence markers per player in the Knight Guild as shown. If there are fewer than four players, make sure to add a dummy row or two so that at least four colours are in play. Next, draw four King Seals to place onto the scrolls in the Noble Guild, leaving two spaces blank as shown. Draw four more and flip them to reveal rosary beads. Then place them into the Monk Guild on the Rosary, like this. Draw one more and flip it to reveal a bead that you place atop a Chicken and the Farmer Guild. Now randomly draw ten goods from the Haversack and place them into the Farmer Guild as if they were spilling out of the barn. Next, place the Epoch Marker on the Sunray marked with the Roman numeral 1. Then draw six goods from the Haversack and place one in the northernmost location of each region, they are marked with the letter N. Finally, select a starting player and give that bloke the starting player marker and the progress die. In turn order, each player chooses three different goods taken from the haversack. Your options are saltpeter, sulphur, iron, wood and food. Anytime you acquire a sulphur good during the game, you must decide if you want it in your wine barrel, where it can help nourish your pawns later. Uh or in your personal supply, where it will let you play two actions in a row. You will notice that your pawns feature six icons representing unique characters you can play, from the dashing Sir Marcus to the dastardly Queen Anne. In turn order, select one of the icons and position the pawn face up beside one of the circled starting locations. Immediately move one of your influence markers into the guild bearing the same icon as your pawn and onto the hexagon marked with a five or the three, if the space is taken. These numbers represent veneration points, or VPs, that you will score at the dawn of each epoch. The object of feudum is to score the most veneration points over five epochs, typically seven to ten rounds. Each round, players use action cards to move pawns, influence locations, interact with guilds, and a boatload of other things. During the game, you will secure membership status in the guilds by putting pawns and or feudums into play. As players improve locations, the dawn of each epoch is triggered and veneration points are scored for guild status, landscapes tended, and the number of regions in which you are active. When the last tile is drawn from a stack, the game ends, and final points are scored to determine who among you is most venerated in all the land. Jolly good. Each round of feudum is made up of five steps outlined on your reference card. In step one, you will select and play four actions, one by one in turn order. In step two, you will nourish your pawns by way of food and or wine. Uh. In step three, you will roll the progress die to remove a region tile. 
In step 4, you will advance the epoch marker and score the epoch if it was triggered. And at step 5, you will pass the starting player marker and start a new round. All steps are repeated until epoch 5 is triggered, at which point the last round is scored along with final scoring. During step 1, players secretly choose 4 action cards from their decks to create a hand for the round. Players may also place a saltpeter or sulphur good onto their player pouches to gain a bonus for the round. A saltpeter lets you add a fifth card to your hand, while a sulphur lets you play two actions sequentially. Once the bonus is used, the good is discarded to the haversack. After card and good selections have been locked in, players must announce, Long live the king! When everyone is ready, the starting player plays one card face up and carries out the action. Play continues clockwise, one card at a time, until all players have played their chosen cards. Anyone may perform the regular action shown at the top of the card, but only players in possession of a particular good or pawn in play may use the special action. Let's begin with the Migrate action. This card lets you add a pawn to the board by paying one food for the journey. Typically, Players must place migrating pawns on a space containing one of their other pawns or influence markers. But because Yellow already has an alchemist on the board, he may use the card's special Distant Kin ability to migrate to any starting location. In this case, Yellow chooses to play the lovely farmer Miss Allison, represented by this symbol. When a new pawn enters the board, a player must also place one of his influence markers onto the guild track of the guild bearing the same symbol. The icons in the upper right of each guild show the criteria for membership. Having the related pawn in play earns you one status star in the guild, while ruling a feudum earns you three. Once either of these two criteria is met, players may gain additional status for each related location ruled. Because Yellow currently has the most status in the Farmer Guild, he places an influence marker on the Guildmaster space. Lesser status earns you a spot on the Journeyman space, and the least status on the Apprentice space. If there are less than four players in the game, the Apprentice space is ignored. The Move action allows you a movement allowance equal to the number of pawns you have on the board. Since Blue has three pawns on the board, he decides to move one of his pawns one space along the road, and another pawn two spaces into the sea. When Blue switches from a road to a route requiring a vessel, he places a collected vessel under his pawn and continues movement along that route. Later he may abandon the vessel to move along another route, making the vessel available to any bloke that happens along. Because Blue just happens to be the monk, better known as Brother Justinius, he may also use the card's special God Speed ability, giving his monk one final movement. At the end of his movement action, Blue may pilfer one resource from any space at which he has arrived. You may not pilfer from yourself, that is to say a farm you rule or a landscape tended by one of your serfs. Finally, three ferryboat routes on the board may be used for a payment of two shillings. Each payment grants the user a single one-way trip. However, all ferryboats are closed if Lord Arthur, Earl of Alchemy, has vessels for sale within his guild. The influence action lets you add one influence marker to each location containing one of your pawns. For instance, Red has two pawns at different locations and may place two influence markers. If you are first to add a marker, place it on top of the disc to become the ruler. If there is a ruler already there, place it beside the disc to become a serf. There can only be two colors represented at each location and only a total of three markers. On a future turn, Red could add a final influence marker here to outnumber and bump Yellow down to the surf position. He could also add a marker here to become a subject which reinforces his rule and prevents Yellow from taking over. If you happen to use the dashing Merchant Lord Brett to influence a location, you may use the card's special Money is Influence ability to pay one shilling to bump any lone ruler to the surf position and take over as the new ruler. Ruling locations can increase your status in guilds and earn you points for active regions at the dawn of each epoch. If you rule a location, the Improve action lets you turn in a resource to improve it. For instance, the purple player could turn in an iron good to replace her farm with a town. As a reward, draw the top tile from the stack that matches the region where the improvement occurred. Then score veneration points according to the region tile chart. The tile must be from the current or a former epoch 
or it is prohibited. In this example, Purple drew an Epoch 2 tile for improving a farm to a town. Therefore, she scores 4 veneration points. If the tile is prohibited, draw a tile from a former Epoch if available. No points are scored, but a tile is collected. Collected region tiles are quite valuable, as they may be substituted for any good at any time. They may also be used to tend the landscape on the back of the tile to generate resources throughout the game. To put a collected landscape into play, you may opt to use this card's special Tend Landscape ability instead of the card's regular ability. For example, Purple may discard one wood to score two points and play her silver mine beside any location where she is a serf. Immediately upon placing a landscape and at the dawn of each subsequent epoch, Purple places three designated resources, in this case shillings, onto the landscape. She may choose to collect all of the resources or let them accumulate. When she decides to collect them, she must pay one resource to the location's ruler. In addition to the silver mine, the other landscapes include the orchard, the sulphur mine, and the archery butt, which produces targets that are traded in for influence markers. Turning in a king's seal lets you improve a town to a feudum. Doing so gives you powerful status in the related guild. For instance, if Purple chooses this feudum, she would gain three status stars in the farmer guild. Earlier, Yellow put a farmer pawn into play, earning him one status star. However, because Purple has three status stars for ruling a feudum now, she bumps Yellow to the journeyman position on the guild track. The moment you rule a feudum, you become a powerful vassal. However, vassals must pay homage to their king by performing several conquer actions throughout the game to avoid losing points for disloyalty. More on this later. If you rule an outpost, the Explore action lets you draw two Royal Writ cards and keep one of them. Return the other to the bottom of the deck. You may draw one additional card for each outpost or feudum you rule to increase your options. If you turn in an Iron, you can use the card's special Shovels and Swords ability, which lets you draw two additional cards and keep one. Royal Writs come in two varieties. Mandates, which typically require you to turn in a good to realize an immediate reward, or Charters which grant you endgame veneration points if you complete objectives and seal the card with a king's seal. For instance, the blue player rules three areas depicted on this sealed charter, scoring him seven veneration points at the end of the game. You may not have more than three royal writ cards in your possession, but may use or discard them at any time. If you rule a farm, the harvest action lets you randomly draw five goods from the haversack to place beside your farm. Doing this scores you one veneration point. As a bonus, you may draw one additional good for each farm or feudum you rule, plus goods for each rosary bead in your possession. For instance, Yellow rules two farms and has a plus three rosary bead. He would draw five goods for his first farm, plus one good for the second farm, and plus three goods for the bead, for a total of nine goods placed beside his farm. In lieu of placing the total harvest of nine goods, Yellow may choose to place a partial harvest on his farm and take the remaining goods as kickbacks added to his personal supply. Consulting the harvest chart, Yellow decides to draw six goods onto his farm and three into his personal supply. However, because taking a kickback is an unholy act, the bead may no longer be used to boost his harvest. Instead, it is flipped over to become a usable king seal. Because Yellow has a farmer pawn in play, he may use his special Inspect the Harvest ability to visibly choose his kickbacks after randomly drawing the total harvest. If you rule a town, the tax action lets you collect two shillings. As a bonus, you may draw one additional shilling for each town or feudum you rule. For instance, Blue rules two towns and thus collects three shillings. Because Blue happens to have a Knight Pawn in play, he may use his special Reinforcements ability to also draw one Influence Marker from the general supply. This is a clever way of collecting Influence Markers, which can sometimes be in short supply. The Conquer action lets you attack a single Pawn or Feudum for a chance to earn two or four points, plus entry onto the Military Service Track. As noted by this icon, this action may not be the last one you perform in the round. If you are attacking a pawn, add up the attack and defense values of all battling pawns in the space. All pawns have an attack value of 1 and a defense of 2. Any attacking pawn may also discard a saltpeter to add plus 1 to his attack. However, a knight may use an unlimited number of saltpeter. A tie goes to the defender. 
For instance, red player's knight with an attack of one attacks blue's merchant with a defense of two. By adding two saltpeter to the attack, red wins the battle by a score of three to two and removes blue's pawn from the board. Because Blue's Merchant Pawn earned him membership status in the Merchant Guild, he must also remove his influence marker from the Guild. If you are attacking a Feudum, you must add up the attack and defense values of Pawns, Feudums, Defending Subjects, and Rebelling Serfs. For instance, here we see Red attacking Yellow's Feudum with an Alchemist, a Monk, and a Rebelling Serf, all with plus one attack, giving Red a total attack value of three. Yellow's Feudum has a defense of plus two, and it is bolstered by a defending subject with plus one defense, giving Yellow a total defense value of three. Even though Red has no knight in his attack, he may still use one saltpeter, which is enough to win 4-3. Red replaces the Feudum with an outpost. All influence markers are removed from battle except for the rebelling serf, who is placed atop the location to rule it. Because Yellow has no more status left in the related guild, he must remove his influence marker from the guild track. Doing so leaves the guildmaster space open. This enables Purple, who held the journeyman position, to become the guildmaster. A successful conquer gives you the option to cover a space on the military service track with a player disc. This is important to feudum rulers, otherwise known as vassals, as they will lose points for disloyalty if they fail to cover each space in sequence by the second, fourth, and fifth epoch. For example, epoch four was just triggered, and Yellow, who rules a feudum, has yet to perform a successful conquer. Not only did Yellow lose three points during the second epoch for not covering the first space, Yellow now loses four veneration points for not covering the middle space, plus three points again for still not covering the first space. If you wish there was a more sinister way to perform a conquer action, you are in luck. In lieu of the conquer card's regular action, you may use a noble pawn to carry out the card's special starve the people ability. If your noble pawn is beside an opponent's subject or serf, remove one from the board and remove all surplus discs from the farmer guild. While this ignoble act does not earn you veneration points, it does permit you to place a player disc on the military service track. If an opponent attacks one of your pawns or feudums, you may flip the pre-selected defend action out of turn to add plus one to your defense and score one veneration point regardless of outcome. If no one attacks you during the round, you still play the card to collect one point. You may also play the card's special Royal Immunity ability to thwart a starve the people attempt by the noble pawn. Turn in a food to prevent the loss of an influence marker, and then place a king's seal from the general supply beneath your marker to protect it from further starve the people attempts. You may use the seal at any time, however your subject or serf will no longer be protected. The repeat action lets you replay any action card you have already played during the round, provided it features the times two symbol. If you turn in a saltpeter, you may use the card's special deja vu ability to repeat a card even if it does not feature the times two symbol. However, the conquer and defend actions may never be played twice in one round as indicated by this symbol. If you play the move action twice in one round, you may place one of your player discs onto the first space of the epic voyage track. If you perform a double move in future rounds, advance your disc one space on the track. When you reach a space with a symbol, draw two royal writ cards and keep one. At the end of the game, if you are leading or tied for the lead in one of the three sections, score the higher of the two veneration point values printed. Any player that reaches the monastery in the mountains will score 17 veneration points. The guild action lets you perform one of three possible guild functions trade, push, or pull at any of the guilds. All 18 options are unique to each guild and are conveniently summarized on the back of your player reference card. First, we will cover the trade function. Any player may trade with a guild. For instance, you can trade shillings for goods, vessels, influence markers, king seals, and prayer beads. When you trade for resources, you must pay guild members in rank order. For example, the purple player buys three shillings worth of goods at the merchant guild, prices are noted under each good. The first shilling is paid to Blue's guild master, the second to herself as she is the journeyman, and the third shilling, unlike the others, skips the apprentice and goes all the way across the board to charity, either to the farmer's purse or in this case the church coffer. If guild members are absent, return their shillings to the general supply except for the apprentice's share which still goes to charity. 
If Purple's goods had cost more than three shillings, she would repeat rank order with the fourth shilling going to the blue player, the fifth to herself, and so on. Players use shillings to trade with guild members, except at the Farmer Guild. Here, a player sends goods from one of his ruled farms to the Farmer Guild to receive one shilling or food from the haversack for every two goods sent. Any goods sent to the Farmer Guild above its limit of ten go back into the haversack, unless there is surplus. The sum of the beads atop the chickens here is the number of goods that randomly spill over into the Merchant and Alchemist Guilds if space permits. Whatever is left or does not fit goes back into the haversack. When purchasing at least three influence markers at the Knight Guild, you may activate and control either monster. Return two markers to the general supply and place the third on the icon that marks the monster you have chosen. Deploy the monster to a space containing one of your influence markers or pawns. Monsters add to your movement allowance, can pilfer, conquer and use weapons just like pawns. However, there are some differences. Monsters pin other pawns unless the pawn migrates off the board or kills the monster. If this happens, retrieve your influence marker. Additionally, monsters cannot influence location, perform feasts, or use vessels, and monsters only have a defense of one. The behemoth may move along roads and flying machine routes, while the sea serpent is limited to ship and submersible routes. Finally, monsters do not need to be fed. They <coughs> eat people. Now let's discuss the push function. Only the Guild Master may push resources out of his guild to the guild on the right in an attempt to complete one, two, or three objectives to score four, five, or six veneration points. For instance, Yellow's Guild Master may invent one, two, or three barrels and or vessels by turning in the required resources per the chart in the Alchemist Guild. If you invent a vessel, place it in the guild. If you invent a crud barrel, fill up the leading barrel section in each player's row with influence markers at the Knight Guild. For example, if one crud barrel is created here, blue gets three barrels, red gets one, yellow gets two, and purple gets one. Completing the push action at either the Monk Guild or the Farmer Guild also triggers the distribution of the church coffer or farmer's purse. The Guild Master divides any accumulated shillings with a journeyman, taking the odd number chilling. If the journeyman is absent, that portion remains until the next distribution. Finally, let's discuss the pool function. Only the journeyman may pool resources into his guild from the guild on the left. Unlike the guild master, the journeyman need only complete one objective to score three veneration points and to draw two royal writ cards, keeping one of them. For example, even though the red player's journeyman occupies the knight guild, he may invent one barrel or one vessel from the alchemist guild to earn three veneration points and a royal writ card. When you perform a push or pull function at a guild, you may add a maximum of one reeve disc to that section of the guild to immediately score one additional veneration point. If you perform a push or pull function with a reeve already in the guild, you earn a point for the reeve plus a point for a reeve you have placed in another guild. In this way, reeves can be a valuable way to run your guilds. However, the more reeves you deploy to your guilds, the fewer player discs you will have for the military service and epic voyage tracks. It may come about that you will witness guild members ignoring the flow of goods in the game. Fortunately, the special feast ability allows you to perform the push or pull function related to any opponent's pawn or feudum you are beside. Here we see Red's monk next to Blue's alchemist. After turning in a sulfur good from his barrel, Red performs Blue's push function in the alchemist guild to invent a barrel of crud. Red scores the regular points plus three bonus points. Cheers! Uh. After the last action card is played in a round, you must nourish your pawns on the board with food and or wine. To nourish with food, turn in a food good to the haversack. To nourish with wine, remove a sulfur good from your wine barrel and place it atop a pawn. At the end of the following round, remove the sulfur to satisfy the nourishment requirement. In this way, wine is a more efficient way to nourish pawns. However, while a pawn carries the sulfur good, its attack and defense are reduced to zero. Unnourished pawns go back into your personal supply. If losing a pawn takes you out of a guild, retrieve your influence marker from that guild. Once all stomachs are filled, the starting player rolls the progress die and removes a region tile matching the region rolled. The tile must be from the current or a former epoch. If not, roll again. Here we see that the mountain icon has been rolled and thus the tile from the mountain region tile stack is removed. 
After rolling the progress die, consult the region tile chart to see if a new epoch has been triggered. Here we see the two epoch 4 tiles are now showing, which triggers the next epoch. Move the epoch marker one sunray to the right, score the epoch, and replenish resources as follows. First, players are rewarded for their status in each of the guilds, the number of landscape they tend, and the number of regions in which they are active. For example, the yellow player scores 10 points for being the guild master in two guilds, two points for this empty landscape, four points for a landscape with resources, and five points for being active in three regions. Ruling locations and tending landscapes count towards active regions. Second, subtract points for disloyalty as directed by each catapult icon on the sunray. Because Yellow's ruled feudum makes him a vassal, he was obligated to cover the next space on the military service track. Because he has not, he loses four veneration points for disloyalty. Third, replenish landscapes with resources. In this case, Yellow places three food onto his orchard and three shillings onto his silver mine. At this time, each of Yellow's serfs must decide whether to collect all the accumulated resources or leave them on the tile. Yellow decides to leave the food on the orchard but collects the shillings from the silver mine, paying one tribute shilling to the location's ruler. Fourth, replenish the map per the sunray's direction icon with six goods randomly selected from the haversack. In this scenario, the westernmost location in each region receives a good. Fifth and finally, if it were the third epoch, all guild spaces would be replenished with resources indicated at setup. This happens only in the third epoch. At the end of the round, pass the starting player marker clockwise, take up all your action cards, and begin a new round. When the last region tile is removed from any stack, revealing the epoch 5 symbol, the game is nearly over. Complete the rest of the round and score the epoch as usual. Then perform final scoring as follows. First, score veneration points per the epic voyage track, here we see that yellow and blue are tied on the second leg of the track. Both receive 9 points. Second, score points for large empires. Specifically, 1 point for each outpost, farm and town ruled, 3 points for each feudum ruled, and finally 3 bonus points for each set of 3 identical locations ruled, with feudum serving as wild. For example, yellow has 2 ruled farms and 1 ruled feudum, for a bonus of 3 points. Third, score one veneration point for each set of three shillings you possess. And finally, unveil your royal writs and seal them to score veneration points based on the level of completion. The player with the most veneration points is heralded most venerated in all the land. If you are tied, the player with the most sulfur left in his barrel wins. After all, sobriety is more honorable. Long live the king!